Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you sit, everybody. Uh, welcome. We're going to be there for, for an hour. We've got an amazing panel, uh, like every year, to give you a vision of where we're going and how the world is changing. Obviously, this year is a different year in the sense that uh, there was a certain number of elements, the first one being the pandemic, but also um, the, uh, the Green Deal, the conscious of the consumers that the climate change is there, um, the reorganization uh, of the strategies of a certain number of companies as well as uh, government. So we're in an acceleration of the energy transition. Uh, the question is, uh, where is it going? Where is it meant to, to, uh, um, to land? Where are the investments uh, to be made? today and tomorrow, because obviously there is a very strong uh, timing a question there. So we're going to cover all of that. The purpose is to give you a vision and some comments. Obviously, we've got uh, after the uh, presentation of the various panelists, uh, we've got the chat. Uh, this conversation is for you. So feel free to ask questions and we'll be there to try to answer uh, them the best we, we can. Um, in order to actually launch this discussion, um, I've got the pleasure to start uh, this uh, moment uh, with uh, Ilesh uh, Patel, uh, who's going to actually um, present you the scene of what is going on. He will go through the slides and the presentation before uh, the uh, panelists actually uh, take um, it, each of them uh, the lead of the conversation to share their views on uh, what Ilesh had just described. So Ilesh Patel is uh, the lead for Baringa uh, Global Strategy and Market Groups, uh, and uh, he is working for over 25 years uh, on the UK and uh, international market, uh, advising across all industry, uh, players, strategy, regulatory investment and commercial issues. Critically, his work has been at the forefront of helping his client to develop, define successfully and implement a strategy throughout the energy transition. So he will be talking us uh, through his observations and expectations for the year ahead and uh, what it means for, for him, uh, the, the energy transition, and what means in particular a low carbon future. So Ilesh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that very kind introduction and a very warm welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to be here virtually with you all. And thank you to Norton Rose Fulbright and the Energy Estate teams for co-hosting this webinar. Norton Rose Fulbright is a firm we as Beringa work very closely with, have a huge amount of respect for both their legal and industry expertise, and are very much part of our extended network in the industry with a shared history and values, and dare I say, friendship uh, with the firm as well. So thank you, Anne, uh, and the team at Norton Rose. It's been just over a year since I delivered the, the last Where to Invest 20, uh, keynote in 2020 uh, in Norton Rose's uh, London office, and, and what an incredible year it's been uh, since then. There's been so much to reflect on, uh, especially on how wrong we all are and were on our predictions of where our industry would focus its time and investment back then. Today, though, I think we're going to look forward and cut ourselves some slack for what we might have got wrong over the last 18 months or so. And dare I say, like a few governments around the world, if in doubt, blame COVID. So first up, um, I believe our low carbon future is here now. 2021, in my view, is the inflection point. Really, one need to look no further than the fresh government commitments from the top emitting countries, China chief amongst them, the imminent approach of COP26 uh, and the G7 summit, of course, this summer, a private sector focus across a variety of industries on embedding climate change into the investment decisions uh, of all players and the increasing and important role of regulators increase in increasing pressure on lenders around climate risk disclosure, disclosures and capital allocation to industries facing significant physical and transition risks due to climate change. Therefore, 2021, in my view, will be the year of climate action. And I think whilst my, this might seem a little optimistic, it also comes with a warning. You know, our generation, as we know, will be the first to feel the full effects of climate change and the last to be able to do anything about it. To make our commitments to 2030 and 2050 happen, 2021 is the year when transition must become transformation, where we must deliver on the promises and commitments we've made to a low carbon future and to build back greener. 
Just today, or just yesterday, in fact, the UK government announced a new UK infrastructure bank, support for hydrogen and CCUS clusters, new retail products aimed at green finance, and a and a carbon offset market mandated by the Bank of England, which potentially will have a role in regulating it. All of that tells us that a low carbon future must beyond go beyond the power sector and must go beyond renewable, renewable energy alone as a solution. And I think this is critically important for how important 2021 is going to be and the key trends that will define it. 80% of our emissions come from outside of the power sector. Therefore, a low carbon future is contingent on just decarbonizing all four key energy vectors, power, transport, buildings, and end users, backed by the rise of sustainable finance. For me, each of these vectors, uh, there are, for each of these vectors, there are a choice to be made on when, how fast, and how to decarbonize. And what role will new technologies play? How will carbon pricing influence those choices? How will heat and cooling requirements be met? And how can countries, companies, and sectors collaborate to achieve more together? Will all be questions that we need to answer as an industry. In answering those questions, we need to consider which options, those highlighted in green on this slide, are available to us now versus those that might reach commercial uh, or viability or scale in the next few years. What is clear is that there is more investment needed as yet in technologies, business models, and financing options to make this matrix of decarbonization vectors and choices real and complete. If I then turn that context now to the eight trends, I think, that which will define 2021. I think first and foremost, there will be a next generation of renewable energy projects which will emerge in terms of market, scalar projects, and business models. Projects and investments will need to move beyond feed-in tariffs and beyond long-term power purchase agreements and into new markets that will emerge in 2021. Linked to this, for me, is, um, is a transformation in clean energy certification, which will become more important than ever. The search for true additionality and the development of a kind of gold standard of renewable certification I think will drive further development of renewable pipelines and a focus on new renewables development. In turn, this investment will be dependent on the development of innovative financing structures, the lending against merchant risk, for example, the proliferation of listed investment vehicles, the task force, uh, the TCFD reporting and risk and regulatory de driven decisions on capital allocation will all play a major role in 2021. All of which, for me, will require the building of platform and renewable energy players, independent power producers, who will need to grow their share of participation in offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar markets, supported by strong M&A activity, and will be the players, in my view, that will warehouse that early stage project risk that really we see few financial investors, even in 2021, yet seem able to carry. These platforms, in turn, will be attractive to the oil and gas majors, and the oil and gas majors and their transformation in 2021 will be critical. They've already made net zero commitments. We understand the strategic focus on investments in low carbon. 2021, though, will be the year when they need to turn from strategy to action. Yeah, 2020, 2020 was a year where they did all their strategy work. Now we're looking forward to 2021 being the year where they enact them. Otherwise, I think they'll be too late for their 2030 goals. And in some cases, dare I say, I think they they may already be undeliverable for some of the ambitious goals being set out by a few of the oil and gas majors. Together with a focus on net zero commitments by corporates, I think this will begin the focus on the 80% of emissions outside of the power sector. Key to this for me will be storage, hydrogen, and carbon capture to achieving commercial viability. Hydrogen achieving commercial viability for key use cases in Australia, China, and the, and the EU already. And I think there's more to come on that. And a major enabler to all of this will be clean tech manufacturing. The development of supply chains, the next generation of equipment manufacturers will need to develop to align to a scale of renewables world and new technologies such as hydrogen and batteries. So those are the eight trends at a high level that I think will define 2021. Let's just double click a little bit on, on a few of these trends and identify some focus for investors governments, utilities, and new entrants. Well, firstly, I think it will be remiss of me not to not to say global renewables will continue to be the bedrock of a low carbon future. Um, the focus on scale, route to market, project innovation to achieve improved returns and new market entry, if you have 2030 goals, um, are going to be really important. And if you're not starting development now, you may already be too late for greenfield development and will need to rely on M&A. 
In onshore wind and solar PV, I think there's going to be some really interesting new markets in Southeast Asia, uh, in Brazil, for example, in Eastern Europe. And I think the focus will need to be on really high load factor projects, renewables at scale, you know, the kind of 250 megawatt projects we see in Australia today, in the Nordics, some parts of the US, and the kind of 100 megawatt scale plus solar projects that we see in large parts of Southeast Asia and China and elsewhere will become the new norm. And the priority markets, we already talked a little bit about that. Brazil, I think, is a really, really interesting market, you know, COVID challenges aside. And I think there'll need to be some additional value creation through bundle storage, optimizing route to market, and ancillary services and curtailment management. And an offshore wind, which um, you know, Europe has really been incubating as a global industry and, and now has gone global. I think key markets will continue to be Europe as a hub, but there'll be multiple hubs, Eastern North Sea, the Baltics, potentially the Irish Sea in the future as well. But North America and Southeast Asia really will be now where scale starts to get achieved as the lessons are learned from the European experience and taken internationally. But, and critically, I think we really as an industry need to focus on getting the cost of offshore wind down to the kind of magic 40 or $50 a megawatt hour level in terms of level of ice cost of electricity. And the ways that we need to do that are really going to require us to focus on grid optimization, coordinating grid infrastructure, that kind of a third of the capex that's related to getting the power from those offshore wind farms to, to the market is where a lot of the innovation now needs to take place in terms of business models. But also connection sizing, you know, and a whole range of optimizations around uh, design, both engineering and financing, are going to be the ways that we're going to be able to achieve that kind of $40 to $50 magic mark where offshore wind becomes grid competitive. I think if I then turn next to decarbonizing industries will require new technologies. Um, so we talked about renewables being a bedrock of decarbonizing our global sectors. I think decarbonizing industries, though, is in particular the harder to decarbonize sectors, will require new technologies such as hydrogen, and it will require them to scale in the next five years. So hydrogen and CCUS are going to be critical to reaching net zero, and there needs to be a real focus uh, on those hard to decarbonize sectors. Where there, key, where there remain key barriers uh, around particular industries. But I think we should be optimistic. You know, I think there's hope in the smelters market, in steel, in mining, in data centers, in transport. And I think some of the, I think three of the areas I'd be exploring in 2021 are around industrial clusters. We've already seen some very good examples of that in the port of Rotterdam, in Germany, in the UK, around some industrial hubs. I think we'll see that expand into Australia and the US as well. So industrial clusters, I think, are going to be a really important bedrock to help in decarbonize industry. There'll be some key choices to make between hydrogen CCUS markets and between low-cost renewables markets versus low-cost gas markets and the role of potentially blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen driven by those more fundamental factors. And in turn, these new technologies will require, um, I think, require uh, require more oil and gas majors to embrace and incubate finance and scale um, these new technologies. And I think they're uniquely positioned to do so, given their skills, uh, existing investments, and presence across the value chain. After 2020, which has brought unprecedented turbulence for the oil and gas sector, 2021 represents a, a kind of watershed moment, the a moment when the majors know they need to diversify and invest quickly and decisively to stay relevant and profitable in a low carbon uh, world. And with 80% of oil and gas sector emissions coming from end use, um, low carbon investment must go beyond core operations of those oil and gas majors, where uh, onto a relentless kind of focus on customer solutions, which are more likely to pay back. And core renewables are going to be a, a building block, but, but paying a premium will be seen to enter new markets must come with a clear scaling strategy for oil and gas majors. So I think what we need to look for is how are they going to go move beyond the small inroads they've made into renewables and new technology and really hit the scale that's going to be required to decarbonize industry. And finally, I think for me, these, um, these clean technologies that we're talking about in de decarbonizing power and decarbonizing industry are, are already developing at a pace and a supply chain of equipment manufacturers, EPC contractors, technology integrators will need to fundamentally shift. We've already seen this in battery, st battery storage technology over the last few years. And in recent years, we've seen wind and solar OEMs leverage their experience and economies of scale to consolidate their market share. This is furthering, I think, product innovation with, a, with adjacent product offerings being developed by, by some of the major manufacturers, which are now approaching commercial viability. I think markets in both 
solar PV modules and wind turbines have become increasingly concentrated with the leading players produce, pursuing those global diversification strategies. And this consolidation is meeting a kind of greater investment in R&D, driving further product innovation outside of the OEM's core offerings. And I think a really good example of that is how some OEMs, kind of like Siemens, GE, Mitsubishi, are, are now moving into hydrogen, both in the electrolyzer market, but also in the turbine market. They're repurposing old technology to new use cases. We're seeing developments both in long duration storage, which I know we'll talk about later. So all of these things, I think, are in the how are we going to deliver a low carbon future? Um, the role of the supply chain and equipment manufacturers and technology integrators is critical. And we're just starting to see, and I think we'll see accelerate in 2021, the innovation within manufacturing to help us get there. Um, and you know, I don't think we can do it without that. So 2021 is where capital investment, R&D investment is going to be as important for how we, um, how we decarbonize. So to summarize, I think we can cut ourselves a little slack for our 2020 predictions not coming to fruition. Um, 2021 is the year when transition must become transformation, where we must deliver on the promises and commitments we made to a low carbon future. And I hope the eight trends and bets I've outlined act as a guide for where you might focus your time, your energy, and your money as an industry. And perhaps I can hand back to you uh, at this stage to chair the panel discussion.